So towards the end of last year as well, we um, we asked for feedback on what was working, what wasn't working. We were really conscious that we changed up the format quite a bit. Sometimes it was really small groups and it was really discursive and open. And sometimes we had you know, speakers from all around the world who were sharing their latest research. Um, and what came back was that everyone was quite liked all of it and quite liked the mixture of it. So we decided to keep the mixture of it. So what we're gonna do is we will have global speakers, we'll have local speakers, um, but we'll get a bit more, um, a bit more structured about how the, how the sessions one run. So the first thing some people said was they loved hearing um, a created list of what reading they should be doing, what was new evidence, what were new papers coming out. So we will broaden that to a what's making us think section. So what are we reading? What's the latest policy papers, research papers, blog posts, funny articles, podcasts? Um, we can't do a reading list because I think now more than ever, what, I, what I'm absorbing is through my ears rather than my eyes um, as you're multitasking. So we will share that. Um, then we'll dive into the core session topic. And today we're gonna define what some of those will be for the um, for the rest of the series, so I'm just laughing at you, Jim. What's the Bond villain? The Bond villain, a, a Blofeld. Yes. In his lair, yeah. Yes. Diamonds are forever. A slightly, slightly softer version in the garden. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and then we'll always try and have a very interactive element of Q&A. And for those that were with us all last year, um, we absolutely want interactivity, chat, um, unmute and jump in. And then where, where the people are still around, um, a 10 minute after party, which is where we stop the recording and talk about anything that uh, might be interesting. Um, so to kick off this week, um, sorry, I forgot the introductions. Um, I'm Liv Penny. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Become Education. Um, we deliver best practice, well, help schools deliver best practice careers education. But for the purpose of these sessions, we're just trying to pull everybody together who's working on that same mission. We're not ever gonna talk about Become or our platform or our products in this. If you do wanna know more, you'll be able to contact us. And Professor Jim Bright, our resident panelist, um, is Professor of Career Development at ACU, author of The Chaos Theory of Careers, and column, regular columnist for the SMH and Fairfax, as you've just heard about and many other things. What, are, what have I missed, Jim? Um, a director of Become. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, director of research and impact for Become. I forgot about that bit. Yeah. So on Achilles heel. Uh, yes, that's right. Still recovering, still recovering from that. That was an unexpected event for me in the, uh, in the lockdown in terms of the, yeah. Um, I, what's, what's, making us, what's making us think? Um, What's making me think at the moment as we sort of crawl out of the lockdown in Australia um, is have we actually learned anything at all? Um, and I suppose what I'm, on the, what I'm looking out for in a somewhat negative frame of mind or when I'm in a negative frame of mind, which let's face it is most of the time, <laughs> um, is um, uh, people snapping back into old routines, into old habits um and old expectations and i think the thing is you know habit habits are great and, and they're so powerful because we don't have to think you know uh, we can just do things we can go on to autopilot and habits and routines are are great for managers because they don't have to think and they don't have to make difficult decisions and they don't have to take risks so what ends up is we have the same old same old um, and I, I must admit, surveying the scene of, of career development academically, um, I do sometimes wonder whether we haven't learned very much at all in the last 50 years. I'm, I'm still seeing stuff about kids being um, taught about interest inventory taxonomies and encouraged to identify themselves uh, with those. Um, and I think, well, you know, if, you know, if Holland sort of came back from the grave, John Holland, who's famously associated with this stuff, um, he might be forgiven for thinking this is 1959. Um, so that I think possibly 
reflects my own impatience with the field as a whole. But right now, uh, and certainly for those of us in the education field, getting back into uh, into sessions, back into face-to-face -face teaching uh, or continuing with it or starting the new year, or any of those sorts of things. Um, how, how are we going to be able to carry the innovations and, and, the, and the, the things that we are forced to do, um, the improvisations we are forced to do in the way that we work? Will it, will it continue? How are we going to continue it? How are we going to keep that, that flame of creativity alive and, and, and really and really build that into a, into a huge blaze that sort of transforms what we do. Um, I, I think it's long overdue um, and I may be wrong and I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm happy to have an open mind about that. I, it could be just my own paranoia here, but that's one thing that's making me think at the moment, Liv. Yeah, I think there's, there's definitely that danger, isn't there? And I think we talked about it at the beginning of last year when everyone was saying how different everything was and all these ideas were popping up that you know, how do we either monitor or, or judge the impact of those things and that we were doing differently so that when it came to this point and we have the option of snapping back or not, then we don't. Um, I think certainly in the workspace with um, you know, seeing people around us who work not in schools, um, no, nobody seems to be, or it's very few that seem to be snapping back into five days a week in the same place um, we're seeing a kind of settling with the more progressive companies leaving it totally open. And I think the middle ground from what I've seen uh, in, in met, with Metro companies anyway, is, is a kind of two to three days um, average in the office that need, they're still seeing that need for um, uh, what they call connected days and, and flexible remote working days. So I don't think if the labor market isn't snapping back to exactly what it did before, would it push uh, careers and schools and everything else? Surely if the labor market stays like that and most, most people out in everyday work are doing things differently still, it will have a flow down effect. You, you see, this is something where I, I just despair of employers with, it, with you know, this, this sort of weasel word, mealy mouth nonsense about we've got to have connected days. Anyone under the age of 96 has heard of a thing called social media and realizes the way that most people connect these days is through social media. So that, that holding on to this idea um, that somehow that the only way you can have creativity is if we all go down into an improvised bomb shelter in the London tube circa 1943 in the Blitz. Um, so we have human contact physical contact um, is the only way we're going to have creativity seems to me to be um, just the sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing it, it, it's just and it, and, it, and I think it's also it's not principled at all this idea where's this this mythical two or three days a week in the office where's the evidence that that creates any greater level of creativity or uh, effectiveness than people being in the office for five days or, or not at all um, well, hopefully they're going to collect a lot of evidence now. We've got the evidence from last year. But the, the one thing I have seen, and this is slightly tangential to what we're talking about today, is that new starters, so young people entering the workforce without a clue about how to work or the job to do, there's so much you learn on the job, it's just overheard. And, you know, you, you absorb a lot from being there in person rather than what people say. So I, I think there is a balance to be struck. Yeah, we see. I I think that just is just a crashing lack of imagination on part of the employers that can't. You can you can people can learn this stuff on the job with a whole bunch of different um, technology uh, mediated channels. Um, and those and yeah, I know young kids are feeling kind of left out. It's only because people from um, our generation. And my apologies for those of you who don't identify with my generation. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, have, have brainwashed them into normalizing this idea that they've got to be chained to a desk after an hour's commute into a CBD. Um, and I think that's how we still present work um, to uh, kids at school. Um, that this is, is something to be done away from home. It is virtuous, it is desirable uh, to do that. Um, the informal systems can only occur um, if in a real corridor rather than a virtual corridor and so forth. And I actually think this is setting up a disconnect between young people's experience of technology and how they interact with their friends quite naturally and um, being suddenly told, yeah, that might work in your social lives, but it won't work with work. And I don't think there's any coherent um, argument. Look, I mean, I'm not talking about 
hands-on, high-touch work here, clearly. Um, but I'm talking about other forms of work which lend itself to social media. And I, that, that's, that issue, and that's why I'm pushing back, Liv, is because it, that's exactly where I see the danger that people aren't going to be bold enough. They'll, they'll use these sorts of arguments. And as for them collecting the data, I reckon, I reckon you're, you're dreaming. You're dreaming. I think it will be, I think pe- companies will, um, maybe the big ones will, maybe the big consultancies will. I think small to medium enterprises won't, and that's where the majority of employers are. And they'll fall back on their prejudices. If they like people in the office, they'll have them in the office. I don't think they'll have a, um, and we're going to get stuck down this rabbit hole, but I don't think they'll be able to attract people if they do that. I think it's as simple as that. They're being forced to because people can see the options and want what's right for them. And most of them that, that I've been in contact with have actually done that what do people want rather than employers going, we're going to dictate it. Um, and are measuring productivity in real terms of, wow, then, and a lot of them have seen productivity go up massively. So we'll see. I think it's definitely something to keep an eye on and, and how we portray that world of work to young people. And I think, I think that really ties into, an, into another point, which is coming out the rhetoric about the COVID with young people. And what part of the rhetoric I'm hearing, and I'd be interested to hear what other people's experiences are here, is there is the assumption that young people's uh, careers have been hugely and disproportionately um, in, injured or jeopardised by, by COVID. And there are far fewer jobs around. Maybe I'm hearing this more from my English friends, uh, where I suppose the impact's been much more severe than it has been in Australia and, and more prolonged. Um, and I'm not in a position to judge this directly through, through experience. Um, but, you know, we, we're hearing figures now about the economy bouncing back here, what, 3% growth or something in the last uh, quarter, was it, or something? So we're seeing big yeah. numbers. Um, I think that's an interesting one as well, that we, that we might get caught up in this rhetoric that young people are being disadvantaged. And that would play against that notion of young people being able to vote with their feet. If they think they're being disadvantaged, they might be more compelled to grab at whatever they can get and feel grateful for it, which might be a mistake. Maybe it isn't, I don't know. But that's, that's an interesting kind of debating point there as well, I think. I, I think we're going to come back to that in a second. Um, Um, because I can always see comments coming through in it. So quickly, um, in terms of what, we'll get through this uh, quick shout out and we could come back to it at the end if you want the links. And there's a few things that we um, wanted to shout out about what's the external sources that are making us think at the moment and things that have popped up that might be interesting. One is, um, who's has anyone been on Clubhouse yet? It's a new... um, social social tool it's basically some kind of mix between talkback radio and podcasting um i'm still working out whether i like it or not but in terms of things to listen to and join in with um it's it's definitely worth having a lot it's only available on ios but tonight there's a there's a i think it's called the vegemite society so it's anything that's happening in australia um are having a big chat about the future of education in australia so do you have to be be invited Liv? You can ask to be invited. Hold on one second, I'll share the link. Um, you never go to parties where you have to ask to be invited. <laughs> it's just a ploy. Um, I'll share the link in a second. But as long as someone you know is already in there, they'll accept you and then you feel like, oh, I'm so special. There are some good chats on there. Um, I'll share the link in a minute and um, I don't know how many people I'm allowed to let in, but um, you can definitely ask if I get in. Um, the other thing that I've just downloaded, which is um, looks interesting, but I haven't read yet. Um, I've heard some great reviews is Long Life Learning, which I thought was just going to be a play on uh, lifelong learning just to grab people's attention. And it doesn't seem wholly new. It's just about, you know, long careers and managing those on ramps and off ramps of continuous learning through work. Um, but it has got some really good reviews. Jim, have you looked at it? No, I haven't actually. No, I, it's completely new to me. I haven't seen that one at all. Yeah, it's just a couple of weeks. Um, It got a really good write-up in Forbes, so I'm going to try and read that before our next session. Um, And the other one that I think we are going to come back to next session is the latest in the OECD education policy perspectives, following on from that PISA data and a couple of other ones about how schools can use careers education to protect young people in a recession. Um, 
so we're hoping that that will, if it's relevant enough to enough people in the challenges that we talk about today, I think there's a lot to dig into there. And we're going to try and get one of the um, writers and contributors to come in and, and answer some questions and discuss that with us. It, it, might, some... hmm? it might be, sorry, to, uh, I was going to say, it might be worth um, us covering in future times the um, UK Parliament debate on career development, which happened, I think, either last night or the night before. Ah, have you got so there's actually think? a parliamentary debate about career development, which is almost unheard of anywhere in the world. So yeah. I'm not yet across what came out of that, but obviously the usual suspects like Tristan will be across that. Have you um, got the link anywhere handy? Uh, I could find it for you. I'll let you know, but I won't get to do it by the end of this, unfortunately. No, okay. Well, that's, and if anyone else has got anything else that they've read, or, you know, we're not uh, hounding the news every day, scrolling through everything, but anything you've read or um, is of interest, by state, by country, um, please feel free to share it in this section or, or flick it to us in advance if you think it's something worth diving into. So please drop it in the chat if you've got anything that you've read recently or things we should all know about. As I said, it could be policy, it could be anything. Um, so today, and I think we've already, I can see that it's gonna be a lively discussion already because we already jumped into it. Um, what are the biggest, uh, issues facing careers leaders in 2021 and before we talk about the 2021 bit we we had this same conversation last year this was the framing conversation for this whole series so I thought it would be worth recapping uh, what were those big buckets that were a, an issue last year the first was COVID and the context specific challenges around that and the second one were those longer term challenges to delivering best practice so first off, let's jump into the, the COVID and context specific challenges. And I'll just pick up on the, on the chat here. Um, so Mandy was saying um, that, you know, the online environment was a disaster for many students, lack of motivation, depression, um, and we should appreciate the direct experience and relationships in school. And I think a lot of people, and it probably depends on the person as well, because I'm sure some students thrived. Jim, you're more than happy working from home independently and maybe because you have um, had that portfolio career. I think a lot of people probably do thrive in different environments. Um, I think, yeah, I, I, I see that. Now that comment from uh, Mandy, uh, I wonder if Mandy is in Victoria, a chance. And the reason I say that is I reckon, uh, and I, I completely, by what Mandy's saying, I agree with her. So I'm not here to um, to argue with that at all. I think it's a really good point. The point is that, you know, it is, online learning was a disaster for some kids um, or many students. It's lack of motivation, depression is what Mandy writes in the chat. Um, and I wonder whether one of the problems that we might have in terms of innovations generally is it's going to be conflated. The innovations we were, that were forced upon us because of COVID are going to be conflated with the negative impacts of lockdown. So in other words, if you could work from home, but then go out to a cafe to see your mates or go to the gym and work out or do all the things, go to the cinema or basically have the normal lives um, that was denied particularly to Victorians, but at one time or another to most of us around the country, um, it may be that online learning is not quite the negative that so many students found. And that is a really tricky one to tease apart because those things happened at the same time in unprecedented ways. Um, so I'm, I'm not at all disagreeing with, with Mandy's sentiment, but I did want to raise, um, to raise that um, as something to be careful to, when you're interpreting reactions and data on this, because those two big events, um, which are kind of you know, related but not the same, happened at the same time. Uh, so I, I think that's an issue. You, to, to your other point, I think what is coming out in the research really strongly, um, which is doesn't, no surprise to me with a psychologist background, is yeah, people are different and people have different preferences uh, for what for what they do and don't want. Um, I, I don't like to fall into simplifications like extroversion and introversion, but I do think that you know broadly there are some people who gain energy from others. And, and for other people, they're extroverts typically, and, and for other people, other people just drains their energy completely and they are more happy in their own, in their own company. I think an overriding, an overriding psychological factor in the design of work um, or learning, I think, is, is personal discretion. 
And the more personal discretion a learner or an employee has, the lower levels of, their, of stress. Um, and this is what we found in the stress research time and time again. It's one of the most powerful findings. If people have a sense of control over how they have to meet the demands placed upon them, they have lower levels of stress. Clearly, support is important too in that. But people having, having control over when, when they do their homework, when they do their, their work, um, and how they go about doing their work, generally leads to better psychological uh, outcomes, better levels of engagement, better levels of productivity. So I suppose one of the things that is dangerous is to get too emphatic that online learning is the way forward and everyone loves it, or equally that everyone hates it. I think we're going to find it's going to be a blend, and that's going to be a, a, that's going to be a challenge for employers. It's also going to be a challenge for the way that we go about um, career education and career counselling. Um, I think a lot of us have been people focused and we like the idea of having a chat with people and counselling people and, and doing the warm and fuzzies. And it might be a challenge for some of us that some people really don't necessarily benefit from that and they can develop their relationships better mediated through a screen or, or through an earpiece um, or, or through simply real old fashioned technology of sitting down and reading something. Um, and I think that's always been always been the case, but we've never really had the alternatives before. Mm. Um, and last year, obviously, there's the impact of lockdown and the con and the environment, but there was also this, um, this fear that you know what they were looking into, they were facing into this awful prospect um, of underemployment and unemployment and lack of jobs and a massive recession. And as you just said, you know, in Australia certainly, we seem to have not uh, hit what we thought we were going to hit. Um, so for young people, I don't know whether all of you in schools with them returning, you know, especially those year 11s going into year 12, probably would have absorbed lots of that fear last year. Is it, have you seen a, a difference in sentiment since you returned? And, and are, we, are we through, Jim? Sorry? Are we through in terms of the labour market and what we're predicting, the doom and gloom? Um, Are we through? Um, no, well, I, I think it's going to be, it, it, will, it will vary sector by sector. Uh, and some sectors are still absolutely struggling. So tourism, travel, mm. uh, airlines are struggling like absolute crazy at the moment and will do for the foreseeable. Um, I think there's some interesting distortions in, in the student market, not so much the labour market necessarily, but the student market. And that is, if you're looking at the moment, I saw... Um, this week, I think it was in Campus Review or, or, or one of these sorts of online things, um, announcing yet more redundancies. There, there, there are redundancies planned or under discussion at most universities. I think RMIT, I know ACU, RMIT have got a significant number. Um, there's a few universities floating around the place not knocking people off. Now, they've got budgetary problems, and a lot of those problems are to do with overseas students not being able to come into the country. It's also political issues with uh, reports that um, Chinese uh, students and their families are being actively discouraged to come to Australia. What some of the um, universities that are highly dependent on those students are thought to be possibly doing will be lowering ATAR scores to attract domestic students to perhaps pinch them from other universities that would rely more on the domestic market. Now, that means it could be a buyer's market for year 12s this year. So all of this doom and gloom about why they're going to go, you might find that this current year of the next 12 months or so, never has there been a better opportunity to get into a prestigious university or, or a competitive course than right now and possibly over the next couple of years. That could have all kinds of distorting impacts in terms of what students um, choose to do and the pressures from their families like, well, you know, I know you want to do X, but it'd be a shame to waste this opportunity to get into Y because it won't perhaps exist again in a few years' time. I don't know what, um, again, what, what the attendees think about that kind, of, uh, that kind of notion, but it's crossed my mind that that could be a, a very short-term and a very immediate distortion. I think that was happening last year as well, wasn't it? I mean, Grace is nodding away there. You, mm. you saw that a lot. Do you want to um, jump in, Grace? Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, it did happen. I mean, there were some university courses in Victoria here quite, you know, obviously the prestigious ones, we typically know what they are. Their ATARs dropped, yeah. Um, 
And I was surprised, but it would have been because of their fear of not having enough students in those courses. And if typically you may be taking the top group of students, um, you know, that's a small bunch. So you had to just, yeah, lower again. I think it's interesting. I remember my um, putting on my ACU hat for a second, my recently departed um, Vice Chancellor Greg Craven in an opinion piece actually, um, and it characteristically provocatively suggested that perhaps some of these, for instance, group of eight universities, and otherwise the Sandstone University is typically the first university in each major city, um, may not have the infrastructure and support structure for students uh, coming in with, with lower ATARs than they normally are accustomed to in terms of you know, familiarity with learning, um, learning support and so forth, which is absolutely standard stuff now in a lot of other universities. I don't know whether that criticism or observation has any validity or not, but it, it certainly sort of, I thought that was an interesting aspect that maybe students will be going into places where they're not supported um, in, a, in a way that they perhaps need to be. Um, and probably won't have that data to to provide insights into this year's year 12 mm. so we won't know the impact of that in time to, mm. to know Indeed. whether was a real valid concern for last year with people doing courses and choosing courses because they could rather than they should um yeah it's a bit dangerous not not having those reports and not having the welfare i don't know whether anyone's heard any any views or data yet um about yeah the year 13s and how they're faring um, feel free to drop it in the chat if you have. I think it's probably too early. Um, and the so the other big part around the COVID was the the mental health um, challenge and and a lot of what we talked about towards the end of last year was this increasing understanding that um, careers and a future outlook was a real protective factor for um, for students in terms of well being. Um, and I really, I'm really interested. I, was, I certainly was became very aware of the number of schools that were were say, seeing that, the number, of, the amount of evidence that was coming out, and the number of schools that were seeing it as an opportunity to to create space for these two areas that are, you know, underrepresented in the curriculum and are vital. So putting them together by recognizing that, you know, careers education has these aligned outcomes. Um, I'd be really interested to hear if there's been an increase in that understanding and whether careers people have been pulled in to address mental health. We've certainly been asked where there are cohorts with, you know, urgent uh, mental health and lack of future horizon and hope um, to come in and, and help from a careers and future outlook perspective. Does everyone else experience that? Is, is there an increasing understanding of that, um, that outcome from careers education? There's lots of shaking heads. <laughs> We've definitely got more work to do there then. Yep. I, I'm, I was, I'm happy to make another comment, but I was just leaving the floor to other people. Uh, all right, but, um, what about Shelley? She, oh, Shelby, maybe should talk. Shelby, yeah, yeah uh, she's made a comment down below. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say that um, our school leadership certainly was far more receptive to to, to hearing about more programs and what is possible within our structures for essentially social and emo emotional well-being, because you know we have myself and another colleague have worked hard to push the angle that you know it's through a futures education program that you can you know feed a student's sense of feeling good about themselves because they've got that opportunity to explore and, and talk through. So certainly this year in what we're trying to do across particularly year 9, 10, 11 and 12, definitely far more receptive because they see it as a way of helping a student's overall wellbeing. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Barry's found that careers advisors have been busier this year than any other, so reluctant to take on anything additional in terms of thinking. I wonder what Barry means by that. Um, why have you been busier? Um, that might be a, a useful thing. It might be an interesting point to discuss. Uh, I think in, you know, the link between career education and mental health has been made for uh, at least 20 years. Uh, Mark Savikas, now retired, you know, he coined the expression, you know, career is personal. You can't separate the personal from the career. 
And obviously, um, you know, careers, um, mental health can impact on impact careers and people can take mental health breaks from their careers uh, and uh, careers can promote me- very good mental health. So the things are, um, are closely linked. And I suppose one of the things that I've, I've argued for for years with governments about is, and it may not be very popular perhaps in this forum, I don't know, or maybe it would, is I, I think that we've got to move beyond uh, a graduate certificate as a minimum entry level into our field. I think if we're going to be fully professional, we need to be post, properly postgraduate. In other words, minimum masters and routinely PhD um, amongst that. Not everybody, but you know, a, a fair smattering, both to keep the research side alive, to keep the discipline vibrant, and keep keep us having have evidence. But I think we need to train people to a higher level, um, both to appreciate and to use and apply evidence but also in areas which, such as mental health, um, which aren't covered, ad- and, and I'm speaking as someone who presents one of these programs, is not covered adequately in a graduate certificate and couldn't be um, appropriately. And I'm not trying to say you should, t- you should take the, the role of the school counsellor um, and expand the role too much, but I do think that there is a proactive role that the careers people can play in that space of self-efficacy and development, which is, which is important. Um, I think there's there's another another issue that that's playing on my mind, um, and it has done for some time with with young people. And, and it, I noticed this over the lockdown and also over the Christmas period that I'm I'm privileged enough to live in in, in quite a, a a nice part of of Sydney, um, where inevitably the property prices are are very very high, and there's been increasing concern amongst the community about um, very aggressive antisocial behavior by teenagers. Uh, And this, and I know adults always, every generation sort of knocks the previous one and saying they're all, you know, all young thugs and the rest of it. But I can't help thinking there is an issue here of children in some of these areas disengaging because they don't see a future because they cannot live in the communities in which they've been brought up because they, can, they couldn't possibly afford the housing in these areas where the housing is short and highly expensive and there isn't much in the way of social housing or low-cost housing, and they feel they have to move away. Um, I, th- I think people in rural and remote areas have faced this problem um, for, for years as well. And, of course, what we're seeing in the recovery, the media full of stories about everything's great, guess what? Because house prices are going up. Well, you know, that's great. It's not good for my son who might want to, you know, at some stage rent a place or, you know, God forbid, buy a place um, because it's just gone out of, you know, further out of um, out of their grip. And then they have to start thinking, do I have to move? And this can also influence kids in terms of their choices about career. And then if we're not careful, career choices are simply made on the basis of trying to satisfy a real estate agent somewhere. Um, and I think that I think that's a concern. Maybe it's just me that has that concern. I don't know, but I I see that as a problem. I don't know how careers people are going to solve it. I don't, <laughs> um, but I I do think that that part of a disengagement is that just the basic cost of living in Australia has rocketed, and many of us have benefited from that and think it's wonderful. But we're leaving people behind. Um, and I think that's a, I, I think that's a real issue. And I know social justice is a major issue in career development right now as a topic. And I don't want to get too much sort of into politics here. That's not really what I'm trying to talk about. But focusing it back on the, on career choices, I do wonder whether that's playing into career choice and also disengagement generally. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong on this one. I'm, I'm not trying to. No, we um, we had a, a group of Year Sevens the other day, and so we just said as an opening, uh, you know, what do you think the world of work is going to be like? You know, describe the world of work that when you're when you're thirty, and it was absolute doom and gloom. It's like the robots will take all the jobs, and um, there will be a bigger difference between rich and poor. These were Year Sevens. The gap between rich and poor is getting greater, and I I probably won't get a driving license because cars will drive themselves. And I probably won't be able to afford a house at year seven. And that was nods all around. It wasn't one particularly tuned in. 
this was the media headlines coming through from them. So I think it is definitely that that hope about the, you know, we, a lot of people say, you know, we, they don't have a concept of work and life. And there's, you know, there's certainly misalignment of, you know, educational plans with their aspiration plans. But there are some realities that they can't ignore. And that is that they probably won't be able to afford a house. So they're real things about hope. But I like the um, Lynette's comment there about, you know, the, the optimistic flip side of all this. And one of the things we learned from COVID and lockdown is that we can actually work from anywhere. So you can buy a house and obviously not in Byron Bay because all the uh, A-listers and movie stars have moved there. But lots of people can now, you know, even if you're working one day a week in a city, that's a that's a, a doable commute and you could work, you can live somewhere else. So, you know, we always try and talk about the optimistic flip sides of all this with young people and they have to manage it, but it's, it is the reality. I think, I think there's a real danger and I, I hear it a lot on community forums where I live um, to the point where I've actually produced some t-shirts which are called Narrow Being Gothic with um, abandoned shopping trolleys on them to sort of point out that this constant refrain of we live in paradise is actually alienating for uh, a lot of people because they think, well, yeah, we live in paradise, but I'll have to leave it soon. So yes, I can work. Mm -hmm. You can work elsewhere. And yes, technology does mean we can spread out and work in other places, but guess who's, guess who's going to be obliged to have to do that? (laughs) Yes. Either. Yeah. Either those who are wealthy enough can go and rub shoulders with the A-listers in Byron Bay. um, And, you know, the rest of us povos will have to, um, (laughs) <laughs> we'll have to move somewhere else god forbid melbourne no no i don't mean that uh, we'll have to move somewhere we'll have to move somewhere else but you know and uh, so i don't know I, maybe this has always been a problem i don't think it's always been a problem because uh, you know most of us were probably brought up uh in a house where we we learned to be continent in other words we we didn't need to have a bathroom at every second door just in case we needed to use the lavatory um, whereas nowadays it seems to be the case that you need to have at least three bathrooms. Um, that's an issue. I know it may sound like I'm sort of mad ranting old fool here, but yeah, there are some, there are some real problems, I think, because this stuff is, you know, salaries aren't keeping a pace with this and this is going to have an impact. And you're saying, Liv, that kids are picking up on this. Yeah. I think um, you need to write a blog about the bathroom problem. <laughs> um, absolutely yeah wage stagnation huge issue and house prices and there's no yeah there's no political will or or motivation at the moment to adjust it um but are you right like i don't know what careers advisors in school can do to address that apart from talk reality and and help them incorporate those those the whole of life into their choices and i think choices yeah I, I think the, the that notion I mean, I've spoke, you know, spent the last 20 years encouraging people to think about reinvention and flexibility. Um, but there is, there does come a point where you start to say to yourself, well, actually, the people who have to reinvent the most are the, um, the ones who are, have the least social capital. And they're constantly having to reinvent themselves, almost to the point of like queuing up in sort of, you know, uh, work sites for work each day. Mm. Um, so I think there's a, some danger sometimes in my own rhetoric around this that, um, you know, there's uh, who's who's really being flexible here, who's really being asked to be flexible. Um, and I think that's a, an interesting, an interesting aspect of all of this as well but again bringing it back to the career thing i think it's something we've got to be mindful about i'm not trying to suggest political action or anything i really i'm not trying to be political about this and i don't think either party has particularly got solutions but i think that we've got to be really mindful of this um in how this distorts people's ideas about what what it is they want to pursue and their pathways yeah um and what about the positives that we took out of those challenges? Because we had a session towards the end of last year, where it's, um, we talked about the, you know, the, the positives that year 12 need to know. And a lot of that was the adaptability, resilience. They've seen change in action. They've seen chaos in action and they've come out the other side. Um, they, they might be able to afford to rent a house. Um, by living somewhere else there was lots of positives that we took out and lots of things that people talked about in their own practice last year such as being able to talk to anyone being more willing to to set up a zoom or a skype with someone on the other side of the world to talk about something doing smaller experiments rather than in-person work experience 
who's who's continuing some of that change what are we, what are we taking forward for this year rather than reverting straight back to to what's happened are there any are there any things that are definitely going to be part of the new plan this year and we had a just drop the drop your thoughts in the comments or in the chat or or unmute i think someone said earlier that um, three schools they've been in this week still aren't wanting to do excursions, so not snapping straight back to that, wanting to do everything in school. And I guess that's probably because the restrictions are still so um, so high and paperwork so cumbersome, but remote work experience is gonna become more common, 100%, and it's just so much easier to handle and so much, you can have so many more examples, virtual information, and parents want all meetings on Zoom. Yeah, I mean, some of that is just, no brainers, isn't it? I mean, the virtual information sessions and expos, when we look at, you know, regional kids and, you know, maybe you could afford one excursion before to, to one thing, but we decided what that one thing would be that they would see. And now it can be so much more personalized with anyone in the world. That's fantastic. I think parents everywhere are happy with the, the Zoom meetings as well. I think there was a really good comment. Uh, I'm just trying to find... Somebody talked about um, thinking differently. Who, where is that comment? Someone might be able to help me with this. Um, a great, was it Juliana? Balance what you said to students, show them the jobs but it's to be created. That was um, me, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's great. And then it was, yeah, that's it, Juliana. Yeah, the reality is there are opportunities. We just need to think differently. That's a really good point. I think that's a really good point. And I think that comes back to, my concern stated at the beginning um I, i'm i wonder you know uh, when are we going to rip up this rhetoric about about pathways and about what you want to be um and and this and this obsession with thinking only about the next move into higher or further education rather than um long life learning to quote the the book that mm -hmm. live cited at the beginning you know when are we actually going to do this rather than just paying lip service to it when are, you know you know we want action when do we want it we want it now you know we want what who is going to be brave enough to equip the kids with a career education which is about fostering curiosity persistence adaptability flexibility risk taking and actually equipping them with those skills and letting the pathways take care of themselves to some degree sure we can give people support around saying when they've expressed something well melbourne offers that or mit offers that or monash or sydney or unsw or newcastle wherever it happens to be sure but putting that at the beginning or or, or trying to narrow somebody down into some kind of interest category and match them off you know this is old old thinking um and i i I'm beginning to think, what are we, how are we going to shake this tree? And That's get a very good link into the second big bucket of challenges that we addressed last year, which was the, if we all accept that, you know, everyone here is talking about raising the bar and we spent a lot of time around, you know, what is best practice? How are we taking the evidence base? And I think, you know, however much we say to your point, Jim, it's not about a single narrowing down to a single decision and lots of information provision how do we, what are the challenges that are getting in our way and have we overcome any of them? And in the last 12 months, you know, I, I see pockets of awesome work everywhere when we're traveling around. And I know there's people doing it despite the system, um, but I really see more and more movement towards a shift and to this whole school approach early often and integrated. But I'd love to, um, I'd love to just launch a quick poll to see what has changed because the first thing in that OECD policy paper, the first sentence is career guidance has never been seen as more important. And when he's talking about career guidance there, they're talking about how teenagers think about it, how they explore it, how they experience future ideas. So it's not just advice. Um, and I don't know whether that's, uh, that's evident to everyone. I'd, lo I'd love to think that that's recognized now. But I'm just going to launch a quick poll to see what's actually changed since last year. Um, so in your context, have you seen an increase in the following areas? 
the understanding of the importance and power of careers education, the understanding of the impact of a future outlook on student well-being. Have you seen a tangible increase in curriculum time allocated, budget, your time, careers and student futures actually in the strategic plan um, and more demand from students and parents. And someone earlier said they've been busier than ever. So I assume that is um, partly what's driving that. But tick as many of those as you have you seen an increase in in your context. Am I supposed to be doing the Anthony Green bit now by talking about the uh, early polling coming in from the uh, <laughs> the booth in Camberwell? Well, it'll be really interesting to see the results of this from this group because I think. Um, Ah, oh, you're only allowed able to tick one. Ah, oh. I had thought it was set up for multiple choice. Is everyone seeing the same? You can only do one. Or you have to do the one that's most important. The one that you've seen the most increase in then. Tell you what you could do, Liv. You, mm. could start it, you could start it again and do it for the first option and then the second option and the third option and just write down the answers. <laughs> yes. Um. All right. Not not much. All right. I'm going to launch it again so people can do a different one. That's a good idea. I'm seeing a slight increase in understanding curriculum time and demand, not much in terms of budget or strategic plan, which is where we know the, the key differences will come from. Um, I'm gonna relaunch it for your second one. See if there's anything else that's come through. Shelby, that's, yeah, I, th I think the, um, yeah, some schools place an emphasis on it and others are just a, a nod to it. Um, what do you think the difference is? Where is the difference between those, those types of schools? Is it all at the exec or is it throughout the teachers? I think it's the exec. That's been my experience this week. Uh, and whether it's on the strategic plan, I mean, we're definitely seeing more schools and systems who have got careers and student futures on the strategic plan. And that as soon as that's happened, it's it unlocks everything. So yeah. we're seeing a big increase in that second poll in the understanding of the importance. So that kind of backs up what the OECD paper is saying that um, it's never been seen as more important. Um, just had a thought then, and it might be a really stupid thought, yeah. and please, please, group, tell me if I'm being stupid. I'm sure you will. Um, what, I wonder what support principles or exec teams could be given in terms of examples of how to strategically plan career development. I wonder if there's, I mean, I know there's the, the old sort of Australian blueprint for career development, but no executive is going to be looking at that. Um, I wonder what resources could be given to executives in schools to say this is what a really good uh, strategic plan that prioritizes career development looks like. Don't know. Well, I think that's what the UK have got. The, the Gatsby benchmarks are so simple mm. um, that if they say, right, that that's what you have to be delivering. And then there's, there's detail behind it for the team, but it's something, you know, six points, eight points that you can actually get your head around very quickly and a framework for ways you can tick that off. Whereas we've got in Australia, we've got the careers education strategy, which is huge document mm. and linked to five other policy papers. Um, I think simplicity is the main one, especially if people are understanding the importance, we probably just need to give them the tools now to say how you do it. Well, um, I would, I wonder if you actually give them example, give them worked examples and saying, here, oh, this is, is here, just, just copy and paste it. You know, I mean, I spoon feed them a bit. I mean, I think, yeah anything that eases it and makes it easy for them and brings it alive and they can edit it and they can tweak it but if they have something tangible 
rather than policies and rather than bullet points or rather than anything like that, they'll actually see a worked example. It just reduces their cognitive load. And it just means yeah. career development becomes a pleasurable thing to include in the plan rather than something which is hard work and it, and it requires imagination from people who perhaps have got very little experience of careers education yeah. or their ideas are very outmoded. Anyway, yeah. just a thought. Well, I think that I think we're talking next session about what works from that. Um, and hopefully that will that links to the last that last link I've just shared is for the next session and talking about exactly what works. So what we're really going to try and do is dig into that evidence and data um, to give them more understanding of what the importance is and hopefully things that you can take back to the exec and a really um, simple, a simple framework um, for what works and what, what it looks like. Um, I just saw a great comment there. Um, Mandy, the talk about it, but no action in the school, is that, do you think that's to Jim's point because they don't know what it should look like? Mm. It's possible. I, I'm very disappointed. We have just formed a new school. I'm now I'm not with CBC anymore. I'm at St. Mary's College, mm. which is a combination of some past schools. Um, and it was very exciting. Here we are with a new school. Let's get this done. And they've created a model of what we're going to be working on. And it's got this, you know, lovely infographic. And I said, where is career education in this? They've got a well-being side, but they've got they've just completely ignored career education. And added to that, I'm not welcome on the curriculum, what would have been called a curriculum committee, learning leaders, which is where so much of how we do things is um, is organised. So I sort of feel that I've been shut out a lot. They've got a person in an office and parents are not allowed to visit the office because of child safe considerations. I have to have a meeting with the parents somewhere away from all my resources. So like all these weird things have just happened that have, that have left me in shock because I thought that we were doing something new and fantastic and it looks like we're not. <laughs> Yeah, Mandy, I hear your pain, and this and I really, this, this really sort of triggers me because this is what I'm worried about in terms of in microcosm what you're experiencing in a in a greenfield site in a new school growing where there's every opportunity and there's no precedent. They just pick up these either don't even think about it in the first place or pick up these sort of hand me down default ideas, and this is why we perpetuate the same kind of constrained sort of one hand tie behind the back kind of approach um and i think we've had as i say the blueprint's been out for what 20 years mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was you know supposedly going to be this lovely guiding light for um educationalists um and you know it has its value of course but Liv is absolutely right too it's not it's not delivered efficiently it's not communicating efficiently people don't want to plow through pages and pages but we're still we're still not at the table we're still not on the committees we are uh we're excluded from stuff and people don't really quite understand what it is that we do or, or the and critically the scope of what it is that's my feeling i'm not in a school but that's my feeling yeah i think we're, we're an add-on we're a service when you're desperate about a kid see the careers counselor give him some direction he'll be fine mm. um it's not something that it is the heart and soul of what a school does and i keep saying why do they come to school why do we bother with this education thing it's so they can go into the community and live a fulfilling life preferably with a job mm. and you know all of the things that go towards making that happen i would have thought i was central i should be on leadership yes absolutely you know? i think um I'm really conscious of time. I'm, we're, we're here for another 10 minutes. If anyone does have to go, thank you so much for coming. Um, sign up for the next session. We'll like to see all of the following ones. Um, we'll have some guest speakers. Um, drop us a line um, if you have a topic or you'd like to present some, some great wins you've had. Um, you can contact me there. Um, but I think in the next session, Mandy, as well, when we're talking about what works, we should definitely pick up on what works to convince people of the importance of this. We're, def we're seeing an increase in understanding the importance. What we've found um, 
is working really well is when we can actually demonstrate the improvement in student engagement. So what do those links to learning drive? Do they drive more inspired learners and the relevance? And we see crazy results in, you know, before we start working with students or they haven't had any career related learning, we ask the pre-program question around, you know, how relevant is what you learn at school to what you're interested in doing in the future? And we often see around, you know, 20 to 25% giving that a one out of 10, which is crazy. You've got a quarter of the kids who see no reason in why they're there. And to your um, point, exactly, Mandy, you're saying, why are, we, why are we here if we're not connecting those dots? You know, it's human motivation to be, it's human nature to be motivated by a future vision of something. Um, and that's what drives what you work on, what you focus on. Um, so I think there's lots of data that we can tap into to share with principals and schools to see not only why this is important, but how it fits. 